just to clear it up for those who, who don't know, um, although I would be surprised if no one has heard of it until now, we're referring to the Yahoo News story where, as Kevin pointed out, they were discussing plans to potentially kidnap or kill Assange. Um, there's something in that article, Kevin, I wanted to ask you about. There's a line that says that this, this, uh, these ideas predated Mike Pompeo's arrival. What, what do you make of that? Like, are they talking by an entire administration? Um, by how much? And, and what does that mean for the things that you and I heard in, in, in court that basically the Obama administration had, had ruled out prosecuting Assange because they knew they'd have to go after everyone else if they did this? Yeah, that's an important detail. Uh, and in fact, we know that the conversations about potentially labeling people, journalists like Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald as information brokers while they were involved in doing reporting on Edward Snowden's documents, NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden's documents, that that was a part of the Obama administration. And that is now a part of the Obama administration's legacy. The idea that there would have been a discussion about assassinating Assange in order to prevent the further publication of documents, uh, I think is troubling. The whole history of the CIA uh, isn't that much of a, of a squiggly line. It's, it's fairly constant. Um, if you're able to tamp down on the kind of brutality and violence that it meets out, uh, it's only for a short period because then they find a way to get back to it or they find a way to legalize them. I mean, the drone program right now is just legalized murder. And we know that, uh, you know, we saw yesterday that the Pentagon has investigated itself and determined that they didn't commit a crime when they killed uh, the humanitarian aid worker or the, the yeah, that aid worker and his family. And there were seven children that were killed. But that's the Pentagon. The Pentagon investigated itself. That's not the CIA. The CIA has another program. And we don't have, we don't have any idea what the CIA's program is doing. And so, like... Uh, like we're not even getting to the issue of the CIA and drones when we react viscerally to the Pentagon not reviewing itself or not not holding itself accountable. So I think the problem for me with the Obama administration is that uh, it didn't shut down the case into Julian Assange. Let's be very clear. There was a grand jury investigation that was launched in 2010 in the Eastern District of Virginia where Julian Assange will likely be put on trial if he's brought to the United States. And while they were prosecuting Chelsea Manning in a military court system, they had this parallel investigation, which we saw some news headlines periodically, like when they were seizing internet data from people who were associates of WikiLeaks, like trying to take uh, anything from their Google accounts or uh, there were other like, like Dynadot. There are all kinds of different people who received uh, these companies that received subpoenas from the FBI for data. They were going after people who had worked on WikiLeaks releases. And we knew that people received subpoenas. Uh, they were, they had an open grand jury. And then around 2013, we have the story um, in the news media. I believe the Washington Post reports that there are, basically going to put this on hold. They feel there's a New York Times problem if they go forward and prosecute WikiLeaks. And Eric Holder doesn't really want to continue this. And I think that's also owed to the fact that they're getting a lot of pressure from media organizations for the extent to which they are relying on the Espionage Act to prosecute whistleblowers in order to stop leaks, in order to stop people from talking about what was going on in the Obama administration. So that's, they're worried that that's tarnishing the legacy of Obama and they back away and don't indict Julian Assange. But as we're seeing, uh, the fact that they didn't come out and do a press conference and say, we're no longer going to investigate Julian Assange, it left it open for the Justice Department to just have it dormant. And then what, what happens is Donald Trump gets elected and because you have like a corporate Wall Street attorney like Eric Holder, who just goes off to work in New York City, and then the people who come in with the Trump administration who are against very clearly principles of press freedom and do believe that they should go to war against journalists to protect the security state, like openly go to war against journalists to protect the security state. Then Jeff 
Borgard Sessions, who is uh, this cartoonish Southern figure who takes over the Justice Department as the Attorney yeah. General, he, I'm telling you, I didn't take him seriously. I thought like he would never be in a position of power in the United States. He used to say these profoundly ridiculous things. I'm sorry, I don't have a clip available and queued up to play here for your viewers, but he used to talk about how there needed to be laws passed in the United States to stop leaks, um, like an official secrets act. You know, he backed ridiculous uh, reactionary legislation that was proposed by Joe Lieberman after WikiLeaks put out the document uh, caches uh, from Chelsea Manning. And uh, I didn't take it seriously because nobody in the Senate really took Jeff Sessions seriously. And then Trump came along and gave him a position. And now he was able to revive the WikiLeaks prosecution or the prosecution against Julian Assange. And not only that, he was able to make leak prosecutions accelerate three to four times the rate of the Obama administration. And they even instituted a counterintelligence unit in the FBI that could crack down on whistleblowers. So that, but, but that foundation was laid by Obama. And then Trump just came into the office and said, well, let's take this baby to 150 miles an hour. If we, if we look at um, the similarities between the administrations, I mean, you know, Biden just comes in and picks off where Trump left off. Cause you know, we, one could argue that Trump really ramped it up. As, as you just said, we're going to two, three times uh, what it was under Obama, and even under Obama, it was he was setting a record. He was setting a precedent of you know prosecuting um, uh, journalists, whistleblowers. But now it's just there's you know there's continuity, and um, I mean it's uh, it doesn't bode well uh, if we're putting it mildly. And I mean just going back to the to the Yahoo news story, uh, there was a moment in court uh, which which we talked about the other day where the judges were kind of. I don't know what it was. I don't know if they were like genuinely confused or something, but you know, they they were basically the defense was basically trying to explain that uh, there's an article, you know, with 30 U.S. officials confirming that the CIA was planning to kill our client, our defendant, <laughs> um, and. I think the judges, they didn't grasp it exactly. They're like, yeah, well, of course the CIA has an interest in Assange. And then they're like, no, you don't get it. <laughs> they have a really, really special interest in Assange. Um, what did you think of that moment? And uh, why do you think the judges reacted like that? I think it has to do with the client state mentality of the UK court system, because I think they know that to speak about this openly requires them to take certain actions that they're not prepared to take. Now, I frankly believe that whatever the outcome, you know, it's possible that they do uphold the lower court decision by Vanessa Baretzer. And I think that the defense team for Julian Assange makes it pretty clear that at least on this narrow part of the decision that is the focus of the US appeal, not the 75 to 80%, which we really should be talking about, but the 15, the 10 to 15% that says, let's save his life because there's, it's gonna be oppressive for mental health reasons. And you look at that and you look at the consideration of all the doctors and you look at why she prefers one doctor over the other and you go through it, you really can tell that she's doing this thoroughly. She's not just making a mistake to throw the case and create an opening for the US government to win at the appeal court level, which if you believe in conspiracies is something that a judge with a career uh, focus could do so that she could also absolve herself of responsibility and not be the one who extradited him to the United States and had you know, blood on her hands if he killed himself. So I think that she actually very seriously put this decision together and it's not just like she was finding an escape hatch for herself. Uh, these judges are listening to these allegations and what's reported in this Yahoo News report. And I think they know that if they're really going to follow this, they're going to have to oppose the U.S. government. And not only the U.S. government, we're going to have to oppose the security agents within the U.S. government who are capable of, as we're talking about, committing acts of brutal violence. Uh, because uh, these are people, not only do they apply pressure to dissidents and activists and people who are opposed to what they do, uh, people who support uh, socialist governments, et cetera. But also these, these are, this is an agency that will use the Justice Department 
and the State Department to pressure other governments not to investigate them and hold them accountable, whether we're talking about renditions or torture. Uh, they also, we also see from the Pentagon and the CIA that they'll work together to pressure other governments not to investigate war crimes. Um, and so with that stated, I think the UK court knows that if they rule against the US government, then they're on the other side. They're against the CIA. They have to worry about being against the national security state in the US. And that is a problem in their heads. And I don't know if they're comfortable in being adversarial. And I can hear it in the way that they react to the arguments from the defense that there's this, there, I don't know which way they're gonna go, but they sort of left themselves room to go in a couple different directions, which is to say, if they think this is a unique case, then maybe they would rule in favor of Julian Assange and say that this doesn't have much precedent for other cases and they're just doing this for one individual. But if they think that they're gonna be setting a precedent, then I believe that they're really concerned and they don't want the Julian Assange extradition case to become something that future defendants future people who are facing extradition to the United States get to use in order to challenge the US government. Um, and so I noticed that when they say things, when the defense attorney said things like, this is similar to other cases, they were quick to say, no, it wasn't because again, like if they agree the same as previous cases, then, uh, then they have no choice but to reject what the US government is appealing. And, you know, I could tell that they're, I just get the sense that they're uncomfortable with challenging the U.S. government. But the fact of the matter is that what is before them may lead them into an uncomfortable cul-de-sac. And the only choice that they have is to rule against the U.S. government. 